The Story of Brexit Britain is a proud island. For centuries we stood alone. Now we stand alone again. Other countries, like Croatia and Spain, need to be part of Europe, because they are clearly cowards. But our country is special, and other countries are queuing up to get what we have to offer, whether it's the music of Sting, or any of our several mild cheeses. This is the future. Europe is very different from Britain. For instance, their windows open inwards rather than outwards, and it's almost impossible to buy monster munch in Bulgaria. No wonder we could not get along. The British are known all over the world for keeping calm and carry-on films. Others envy our sense of humour. We do not get worked up. We behave with common sense and treat each other with polite good manners. Brexit has been Britain at its best. Being in the European Union is terribly complicated. Leaving it is terribly complicated too. Luckily, the choice on the ballot paper did not look very complicated at all. It was something about freedom of bananas. Like a lot of his friends, Iggy was not very interested in European federal politics. He did not know whether to vote Remain or Leave. He was hoping there would be a third option to kick the Prime Minister out of a window. He would have happily ticked that box. A lot of the arguments for staying in Europe were not very convincing. Some people called it Project Fear. But sometimes you have to take a risk for good things to happen. Leaving was the will of the people, sighs Angelica's father. He voted to leave. Angelica voted to remain, but she feels the same way. It's the will of the people, she sighs. They stare at the ducks. They like the ducks. Ducks are better than people. The Prime Minister organised the referendum because he was sure everybody would want things to stay exactly as they were. But it turned out that not everybody was having a nice time as the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister ran away. It was quiet in the Prime Minister's shed. Brexit gave her lots of exciting new words, like Brextremist, Remoner, Bremoner, Remaybe, Bre-brehensible, <laughs> Remaintenance, Brexorcist, Remaidston, Brex Girlfriend, Remange, Brextortion, Remayhem, and Brigret. The new words make it harder for foreigners to understand what we are saying. <laughs> In a tough new international business world, small advantages such as this can be crucial. <laughs> Tess voted Remain. She spent the morning after the referendum trying to cheer herself up by watching a film from the good old days. She chose the film Threads. Montmorency de Duchelord points of Fring <laughs> and his friend Sir William de Flourney were glad the public voted leave. Like so many landowners, newspaper barons, hedge fund managers, firebrand backbench MPs, expat billionaires and Russian oligarchs, they thought it was high time the ordinary people of Britain got a chance to send a strong message to an out-of-touch elite. The day after the referendum, Helen woke to discover that she shared her country with millions of simply awful people she had never met, who thought the exact opposite of her about most things. Helen wonders if there could be a referendum on those people leaving instead. Evelyn makes lots of jam. The jam is sold all over the world. British jam is very popular. Brexit had made Evelyn's job much easier. She can put whatever she likes in her jam and sell it to whomever she pleases. Without Evelyn's jam, the British economy would collapse. Adel and Lucy have not spent Christmas with Lucy's parents since they fell out very badly after the referendum. They had waited many years for a good reason to spend Christmas at home. So it wasn't all bad. Tamara's company sends and receives information from all over the world. While the information passes through the company's British office, it is British information and free of interfering European restrictions. As soon as it leaves the building, it's tied up in red tape again. But it's nice that it's free for a while. Vernon is not worried about foreign workers leaving. 
British people can mop up in hospitals and supervise veterinary conditions in abattoirs, and stand in fields picking beans, he says. Vernon will not be doing those jobs himself, of course. He is sixty-three. He is thinking of his nephew, Clobble, who spends all day watching Fortnite gaming videos on Twitch. Giles heard that a lot of big companies were planning to leave Britain because they thought that Brexit might be bad for business. Giles panicked. He relocated his bucket and spade shop from South End Pier to Gustad in Switzerland. <laughs> Brexit has certainly been bad for Giles's business. Diggory lives in Islington. He's a parliamentary private secretary at the Department for Exiting the European Union. He has spent the last two years enacting the will of the people. It's not the will of any people he actually knows, so he's not really done much towards it. Someone will work it out, he says to himself. They usually do. Buchanan knows a think tank called I Deary Me. I Deary Me, which has very close links to government. I Deary Me proposed a super hard option called Concrete Brexit, which would have shut down all trade with Europe. It'll probably be fine. Whatever. Maria applied for dual nationality because her mother is French. Maria has never been to France. I don't like garlic, she says. It smells of wet espadrilles. Cornwallis tells everybody that he's got his country back. He has even started a private militia to deal with anyone trying to enter the village who does not know the fourth verse of the national anthem. In the first week, he had interned 38 undesirable types, including his own plumber. In the months leading up to the Brexit deadline, sensible people everywhere stockpiled water in case the taps went off. A government bus drove around Britain bearing the slogan, Only the idiots will go thirsty. A bus is a very good way to convey important information. The staff of Burlington's widgets have come on a works outing to the theatre. The play turns out to be a bit French. Half of them decide to leave. They say they have plans. They do not have plans, but they blame their friends who remained for ruining the night. When the Nazis flew over the White Cliffs of Dover, Britain fought back bravely, with nobody to help except lots of pilots from Eastern Europe, Canada, Africa, the USA and the Caribbean. When we cracked the secrets of the Nazi Enigma code machine, we needed nothing but British ingenuity and a Nazi Enigma code machine stolen for us by some Polish spies. We stood alone before. We can do it again. Can't we? The end. Don't forget to like and subscribe and press the wee bell notification. And a huge big thank you to all my subscribers, patrons and members. See you next week. Bye bye.